This is Business Weekend. Hello and welcome to a special Christmas edition of Business Weekend. I'm Edward Boyd. Coming up on the program, we reflect on the year that was, recapping all the big deals and company news that's affected our stock market and investors. We'll get the lowdown from our panellists, Catherine Orfrey from Wavestone Capital and Adam Dawes from Shaw and Partners. We've taken a lot of the pain in the stock market this year, particularly on the industrial side. We haven't seen it come through yet. And we'll sum up the developments in the global economy this year. It's been a busy one. Will interest rates keep rising? We'll get expectations for the year ahead with two of our regulars on this program this year, independent economist Warren Hogan and Sarah Hunter from KPMG. I just can't see the, the rate of good spending continue the way it has been. There's only so many whippersnippers we can put in our garage. Plus, I'll be joined by Eleanor Cray from REA Group to sum up the trends in the property market, which has been under pressure since rates began rising in May. So that's all coming up on Business Weekend. And we have seen that property prices have begun to fall in, in most places. But first, let's go to our top story. A turbulent year for Australian companies in 2022. I've summarised the highs and lows of the year in corporate Australia, from the Optus and Medibank scandals to the failed demerger and hostile takeover of AGL. We've covered it all during the year. So here's a snapshot of some of the major interviews we've done with Australian executives over the past 12 months. The movers, the shakers, the shakedowns and the takeovers. 2022 had it all. Let's rewind and look at the biggest headlines and scandals of the year. Not one, but two major data breaches. First, Optus. My hope is that through this terrible incident, we all learn, we get stronger, and we become better. Not just at Optus, which we're fully committed to do, but also share those lessons more broadly so the whole of Australia can get stronger and better. And then, Medibank. Uh, this is a malicious attack to uh, create the most harm and uncertainty for our customers in the community. A growing trend of cyber attacks targeting Aussie companies, leaving consumers exposed, vulnerable and concerned. From the high rollers that finally got rolling. It's a conditional opening and we still could find them unsuitable if after 18 months, two years, we're not satisfied that they're suitable, then we could still go into a process which would ultimately mean they forfeit the licence. We've increased our responsible gaming team by 60%. We've overhauled the board, the management, and we've driven this change across every part of the organisation. And I think we do recognise we have a social licence to operate alongside our regulatory licence. And if you lose the social licence to operate because you lose the trust and respect of the community, then that's a pretty bad business model. Yeah. To those who ground to a halt, the Star Entertainment Group has been fined $100 million by the New South Wales gaming regulator in response to breaches at its Sydney casino. The Star's Sydney casino licence will be suspended from Friday. 2022 has been the year of takeovers and buyouts from resources with BHP and Oz Minerals to banking with Suncorp selling its consumer banking division to ANZ and to energy with the Brookfield proposal to buy Origin. Whilst at times it all seemed like downright mutiny. I think it's quite clear that the company needs a plan for a more aggressive transition away from its fossil fuel generating assets. That's for a number of different reasons. Firstly, they're generating very expensive power. They're incredibly unreliable, as we've just seen. We had two breakdowns in the last month, resulting in a more than almost $120 million write-off in profits. An energy crisis that's seen soaring commodity prices and the cost of living woes echoed around the country. There have been some winners amongst all this uncertainty. Ukraine produces about 80 million tonnes a year of grain. It represents about a third of the global market for traded grain. So it's really important in feeding the world. That's clearly been disrupted. Uh, right at the moment, they're coming out of the winter there. So uh, it's a bit unknown uh, what's going to happen with the upcoming crop. But it's fair to say it's going to be disrupted at least for the next year and possibly a number of years. Achieving great things for those in need. We deployed some of our products, portables, at the start of the Ukrainian war under the uh, under military aid program from, from one of the European governments. And while some innovation inspired, others didn't transpire. 
It's been technology they've been trying to implement for all of this time. They've had troubles, technical troubles along the way. And even though they say it is delayed at this stage, effectively it seems to be dead in the water. While getting off the ground led to a boom for some post-COVID. What we are saying, though, is that we do have to cover this oil price, like all businesses do. Um, and we, we are seeing oil being 80% higher this quarter than it was before COVID, 60% in the year. We've got a, a billion dollar extra to pay this year that we did in 19 with less flying. So we are saying that the airfares have to go up a rask. It was not necessarily a win for consumers. Qantas has become one of this year's biggest brands to receive a Shonky Award after extensive criticism. The consumer advocacy group Choice says the awards are given to brands that have ripped off Australian consumers. From overseas hackers to Aussie-led innovation, takeovers, makeovers and everything in between, we've seen and done it all this year. What will 2023 have in store? Let's take a closer look at all the big headlines of 2022. Ross Greenwood sat down with Catherine Orfrey and Adam Dawes and asked them what they thought stood out as the biggest deals of the year. What stands out for you as the biggest deals of the year? Biggest deals of the year? Yeah. Uh, Oh, clearly the Origin deal that's just been announced yes. you know, in terms of dollars. That's <laughs> There's right. an $18 billion enterprise value deal, so that's huge um, and not really expected. So I think that surprised the market. I think in terms of um, scandals and something that every listed company has to take into account is the whole cyber security. Yeah, so that's Medibank Private. Correct. And then before then, Optus. Yeah. But then the interesting thing is, when you go to that energy space, you had so many deals. You had Andrew Forrest and his private company taking on CWP, uh, $4 billion there. And then on top of that, of course, you had Mike Cannon Brooks and his Grok Venture. Mm -hmm. Originally, the interesting thing about that was you had Brookfield originally bidding in tandem with him to take over Australia's largest and oldest energy company, AGL Energy. Mm -hmm. And then Adam, of course, Brookfield then backs out and goes and takes over Origin, which is, you know, the real surprise. There's a massive shake-up there at a time when the energy industry seems to be almost in crisis in this country. It's definitely in crisis, and the government's definitely stepping in, as we're seeing right at the moment. But the, the reason why I think Brookfield did walk away from AGL was the energy transition period that AGL was going to be able to become fully renewable was a lot longer than Origin. So they went to Origin and they said, can you do this by 2030, 2050? Where, when can you do this? Origin said, yes, we can. AGL still had that legacy Loyang coal power plant. They had all of these different legacy issues and they couldn't get that transition in time. So Brookfield walked away, went to Origin, put a thumper table, uh, a bid on there. Potentially, is it going to go happen? I'm not too sure because I've got FERB. Uh, Foreign Investment Review Board, which I think they're going to be really struggling to get that across the line due to the fact that energy is such a uh, ridiculous political football right at the moment. Well, it really is. And the other aspect of this, Catherine, really in some ways it was almost the year where private equity almost took over mm. and it's almost the patient capital now and even some of our biggest super funds are now becoming very active participants directly in Australian public companies. Yeah, we've seen that obviously last year's with Sydney Airport. That was another, you know, big deal that happened as well. Um, and there's no doubt it'll be interesting next year how it all turns out with these super funds because we've taken a lot of the pain in the stock market this year, particularly on the industrial side. We haven't seen it come through yet on the unlisted side. So it'll be interesting to see how some of those marked markets of those private investments come through. And really what is absolutely no doubt is the movement in the market, the big lurch downwards, was all about the interest rate story. Correct. So as a result, the yields suddenly blow out um, on property and on shares. And so the valuations come off big time. Now, this obviously led to superannuation funds, funds managers having a tougher time to mm. find that value, but also if they were cashed up, to be able to extract some value for the future. Yeah, exactly, Ross. <laughs> I've said exactly. So, so what did you buy then in that case over the past 12 months? Oh, uh, look, we've, we've been selective on the industrial side. Resources, obviously, have been the big winners of yeah. 2022, particularly in the last couple of months. And particularly coal companies. Coal, unbelievable. Coal, LNG and lithium. That's been the story. So we were looking the other day at some of the top performing companies and you, you're just going to go through them all. Yan Coal is there. Stanmore is there. Uh, what's the other big one? Whitehaven was the big one. Whitehaven was the massive one, right? Yeah. So they're, all of these coal companies 
that at one stage you literally, Adam, could not have given away, yeah. suddenly became the great performers yeah. of, of 2022. Mm. And one of the things that Whitehaven has done fantastically is that they've said, we're going to reduce our dividends, but we're going to continue to buy back our stock. And they've going, they're going to literally buy back up until the 31st of December. And then there's another program that's going to go into the January, February, March period where they're going to continue to buy back stock. It's going to be around about 30% of their overall uh, shareholder base is going to be bought back in the next six months. And when you look at that from an NPV valuation, that means that obviously shares are going to continue to stay higher for longer because their earnings is going to continue as well. So as long as the coal price yeah. stays where it is, and yeah. we think it will, um, but, yep, it will be a fantastic bonanza for all coal holders, shareholders going forward. But then we go to another energy story this year, which was one of the biggest deals of the year, there's no doubt, and that is the BHP Woodside deal that went through. Mm. Now, for BHP to suddenly say, we don't want energy and gas anymore, we're going to be prepared to stick on these other fundamental issues, including iron ore, including some of the, the phosphates and so forth, to feed the world. So they were really about the, the future metals as well, yeah. leaving Woodside to become one of the the largest energy companies in the world. Yeah, and also one of the best performing stocks this year. Yeah. Yeah, because it also found itself with about 25% of the gas that they could sell into the spot market to take advantage of that Asian LNG price that went, you know, spiked up towards $40. And that was also exacerbated when Ukraine was invaded by Russia. And so, as a result, the world needed gas, and it didn't matter where that gas came from, they were prepared to transport it to overcome any of the energy shortages that could take place during the winter. So, you're right, spot markets went berserk. It didn't matter whether you sold it into Asia or whether you could get it into Europe, it was going to get a, a pretty big premium at that time. Yeah, which is the same as the coal price. They're all interlinked. Yeah. OK, so then on that subject, yeah. which is Russia, Ukraine, go to agriculture stocks. Mm. They have had a bumper time, Adam, over the past yeah. 12 months. Well, it's obviously helped that we've had some fantastic rains through the winter period and now coming into the summer period that ABARES came out with a report on Grain Corp basically saying it's the best it's ever been and it's probably the best it's ever going to get for uh, the weather patterns that are happening at the moment. But absolutely right. Ukraine, I think, was the third largest producer of grain across Europe. They had to then find somebody else to fix or to, to find supply. And that's where Australia definitely came in. And that's what's kept these grain prices moving higher and doing very well going uh, forward. OK, so that, that's one part of, of that story. And, of course, the whole feeding of the nation and the, the floods that you talk about and, therefore, really good rains in many yep. parts of Australia. But the floods clearly caused, caused devastation to many parts of Australia. Insurance companies were not immune from that, were they? No. They were seeing record claims this year unfortunately for them. Um, but interestingly, you know, we're at the end of the La Nina weather pattern. So in terms of insurance claims, they've had a horror three years, right, for the insurance. And actually just in the last couple of months, you've started seeing their share prices improve. So they may be a sector in 23 that does well. All right, so that being the case, have you mm. climbed into them? In oh, a we've while? been doing some have more research. Been, have you been, been doing some more research? Well, I like that. <laughs> That's very good. Well, I think the reason why the, the insurance companies did so well also was higher interest rates. means yes, that correct. a lot of that money that they've got sitting on the sidelines is going to earn them more interest or mm. more money. Investment and, income. Yes. And hence that's why the insurance companies have really started to tick up and get mm. a bid over the last coming couple of times. A lot of people have talked to me about QBE, but always a perennial disappointer. Yes. And I'm not dip, I'm not getting my fingers burnt this time around, <laughs> albeit it does look quite good for the insurance businesses at the moment. OK, because you're right, it has been a perennial disappointer. But I want to go to that whole issue of raising interest rates. The Reserve Bank had done this consistently. The idea was to try and quell the consumer yeah. demand. Now, let's be honest, when it came to airlines, there was no quelling of consumer demand. Mm. Qantas, the turnaround yes. of Qantas has to be one of the most impressive stories of the year, mm. but one of the most impressive turnarounds of any company we've ever seen. Yeah, because you've seen a rational industry stu structure with Virgin and Qantas. Rex has got about 2% of the market, so they're pretty irrelevant. 
and then Qantas has got, you know, 70% and then Virgin has the rest. So they've been a huge beneficiary of what's happened over the last couple of years and clearly we're all paying for it in terms of prices, but we all want to travel, right? So they're all benefiting. But to turn around what have been a, a, a record loss, yeah. billions upon billions of yeah. dollars, to suddenly to say to the market, well, actually, we might make $1.5 billion this year. And a buyback. And a buyback. Yeah. So all of that meant that really, in many ways, though consumers might have been grumbling about the price increases, the fact is that Qantas could manage its capacity. Mm. It could actually therefore manage price. And oddly enough, long term, that's not a bad thing because as soon as we start to think, well, OK, six or 700 bucks to go Melbourne. Sydney, Sydney, Brisbane, wherever it might be, or yeah. more to go to Perth. Yeah. Well, under those circumstances, if we kind of get used to that idea, well, that's going to stick around for a while for them. Well, as soon as they raise the prices, do you know? Do you ever see it go backwards? Yeah. Anyway, but I think there's there's a lot of pent up demand from COVID that people couldn't travel, couldn't do things, so they've had these vouchers. That's all now starting to work its way through the system. I do feel that next year, the airline prices, tickets will start to reduce a little bit but the demand will still be there for those flights. Sydney and Melbourne is the second or third busiest route in the world. We're always moving backwards and forwards between those two cities, uh, and, and these airlines are definitely taking advantage of that. OK, so, Catherine, moving head forward into next year, mm. what I've wondered, and even with our economics panel, we're having a chat about that, whether there's a brick wall out there, a brick wall for consumers when energy prices and when interest rates catch up with them. No. Their consumer demand is subdued which means that affects companies' earnings and sales, which therefore potentially affects the markets. Now, oddly enough, the market's been buoyed by falling interest rates. At some time, they stop as well. So what I'm wondering is whether there's a bit of a black hole for the market and maybe even for corporate Australia going out into 2023. Mm. Well, definitely, if we went back six months ago, we sort of thought that it was going to hit in the half we're in now. It actually probably is not going to hit till mid-year next year, is what the banks tell me in terms of when they look. And they say the biggest thing that we've all underestimated is the actual wage increases that we've seen this year. And that's hitting, obviously, people's accounts as well. So nominally, people aren't doing too, you know, too badly. And then the mortgage rate increases always come through with a lag of somewhere between 30 and 60 days. So they're still putting through those mortgage rates coming through. Um, but I agree with you, you know, energy prices are yet to come up, cost of living pressures are everywhere, food prices are up, so, and then now, clearly, uh, the interest rates will hit their mortgages. So is that a That's reason for hurt. people to be a little wary as to what happens in markets? And certainly that earnings period leading into August, that could be the one that ha people might, have, might need to watch. Yeah, I, I clearly think that in February, corporates will be calling out the next six to 12 months will be more difficult in terms of the consumer. So we will see that and people are wary. But is it priced, right? Retail stocks have been down like 25% this year. Um, and so the question is, they're all trading on pretty low multiples. So any sort of surprise on the upside, those stocks seem to, you know, to rise and get through. But um, it, it will be an interesting year next year, Ross. There you go. Adam, what's your own feeling on that? Look, I think overall, if you look at this Christmas, it's going to be the best Christmas that we've had in two years. No travel restrictions, no issues. Everyone's going to get together. They're not going to worry about next year. We're all going to have the hangover, which is going to happen next year. Mm. And that hangover is exactly what we're talking about. We're a little bit concerned of how those numbers are going to look. Consumer discretionary stocks, potentially with higher interest rates, inflation is going to continue to come down. It's going to be sticky, though, and I think it's going to be relatively high. And as we see this inflation coming off, it's not going to be down at 2 and 3% anymore. I think it's going to be a little bit higher, and that's what I think is going to concern the markets, is that it's going to be stubbornly high for longer, which means that if central banks are going to have to readjust their positions going forward. That causes uncertainty. I think it's going to be a tough year for 2023. Adam Dawes, Catherine Rolfe, thank you so much for lending me your brain today, <laughs> and have a wonderful 2023. Thank Thanks, you. Ross. Coming up after the break, we'll take you through all the key economic events that happened this year, both here and abroad. Welcome back. It's hard to believe that interest rates in Australia began the year at the record low of 0.1% and now we're finishing December at 3.1%, the highest level in a decade. Let's take a look back at this year's major economic events. It was a year that started harmlessly enough. 
a standard profit reporting season in February led by strong performances from the banks, retailers and resource companies. The Commonwealth Bank today reported a big jump in profit in the last six months. Cash profit for the half, $4.7 billion. That's up 23%. But then on February 24, Russia invaded Ukraine and kicked the economic hornet's nest. <laughs> Commodity and grains prices rose, triggering a sharp increase in global inflation. And that meant interest rates were on the way up. The cash rate was lifted off its record low of 0.1% in May, the first rate rise in Australia since 2010. And then the RBA increased rates seven more times, finishing the year at 3.1%. I acknowledge that the increase in interest rates comes earlier than the guidance that the bank was providing during the dark days of the pandemic. Australian households were shocked by Governor Lowe's rate call. Many saw it as a broken promise after the Governor told households for years rates were unlikely to rise until 2024. Can you give Australians some certainty around where the cash rate is likely to peak in Australia? I don't like doing this, but can I correct you? Because I did not promise. If you look back carefully, you never said that. The economy is so much better. It wasn't long before the International Monetary Fund was forecasting a global recession. In short, the worst is yet to come, and for many people, 2023 will feel like a recession. And after visiting the IMF and the World Bank in Washington, D.C., the Treasurer was quick to adopt similar language. Uh, the global economy is treading an increasingly narrow and perilous path. The problem for every central banker is rising inflation, and we only needed to look across the ditch to see what happens when inflation starts to jump too quickly. New Zealand inflation jumped to 6.9% in the March quarter, rising to 7.2% by the end of September. And the RBNZ said it was happy to induce a recession to bring inflation down. Core consumer price inflation remains too high. Employment is beyond its maximum sustainable level and near-term inflation expectations have risen. And it was the same story across many of the world's major economies. Energy price rises in Europe caused inflation in the UK to hit double digits. These are big changes. They have a real impact on people's lives. But the central banker that took centre stage this year was Jerome Powell, who raised interest rates again in December to 4.5%. And the Fed is expected to lift them again in January. We understand the hardship that high inflation is causing and that we are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. We've covered a lot of ground, and the full effects of our rapid tightening so far are yet to be felt. Even so, we have more work to do. As for our own governor, well, he's been lucky to finish the year with his job. Yeah, I know there have been um, calls for me to resign. I just want to, as I said before, I have no intention of resigning. I have an important job to do. Uh, it's a responsible job and I intend to do it. Next year we can expect more rate rises and the strong likelihood of an economic slowdown in Australia and a recession in major economies like the United States and the UK. We expect growth to slow right back to around 1% uh, for the consumer spending piece of, of growth as well. Um, that's, you know, that's a per capita stalling. Essentially the back half of next year is shaping up as very flat as things like these fixed rate roll-offs and interest rate tightening really bites hard. Uh, so it's, it's looking like a very challenging year ahead. So to drill down into more detail on the RBA, Ross Greenwood caught up with Warren Hogan and Sarah Hunter and he started by getting their take on the review into the Reserve Bank and what it means for the RBA and interest rates. Well, I, I think for the very near term, actually, it's probably not going to have too much of an impact on um, interest rates. I think we'd have to have some pretty big conclusions from it, say a change in the target band for inflation, and then those implemented very quickly for that to have any impact in 2023. But you're not wrong. It does sort of uh, provide an opportunity to lay out how the central bank might function going forward. And obviously, these reviews are, you know, they don't happen that frequently. So it is a bit of a watershed, but I'm not sure it's going to have too much of an impact in the near term. OK, but Warren, that review was caused as a result of a some sort of a disgruntlement about the Reserve Bank and its role, about inflation targeting. Now, the whole question about this now is that the Reserve Bank at some point is trying to maintain a soft landing for the Australian economy. In many ways, that's the way in which it retains its credibility as a central bank. 
Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it's about making sure inflation is under control than it is about trying to make sure it's under control without hurting the economy too much, for sure. Um, but I think the, 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 the inflation target, I don't think, is going to change. If, it, mm. if anything, it'll be widened. And the governor gave a speech at the end of 2022 talking about the increased frequency of supply mm. shots, the need for more variability around... Inf there will be more variability around inflation. I think the big change is likely to be the governance and structure of interest rate setting, and that is the setting up of a monetary policy committee separate to the board with economic experts deciding the direction of interest rates. And I think that's potentially going to be the most interesting outcome of the review. OK, so, Sarah, then you've got the situation of the cumulative effect of the interest rate rises that we've seen during this past year, plus energy prices, plus inflation, plus potentially wages. The argument is, at some point in the future, the consumer hits a brick wall, mm -hmm. that really their spending, um, their savings run out, uh, their confidence runs out, and that could be really the moment that the Reserve Bank needs to pause, to look at the economy and consider its job is done. Well, I think we're already seeing signs that consumers are pairing back in terms of growth. You know, the retail trade numbers for the September quarter volume terms are actually down a little bit. Um, and with that seems to be continuing through the data. And while I was really interested in the inventories position, particularly for retailers, because it does look like they've overordered. And so, you know, we're seeing that come through, I think. Um, and it's going to be gradual. I don't think we're going to see um, a sort of brick wall effect. These things always sort of take time to flow through. And we know, particularly for some households, as they roll off their fixes um, onto variable rate mortgages, that's a, a slow process. It's not everybody changing on the same day. So um, I think it'll be a bit more gradual than that. But you're right, that is what we're likely to see next year, a, a really sharp slowdown in momentum and consumer spending. That is what we need to see. That's what the RBA are going to be looking out for. I think it's helpful that actually they get a break in January. It gives them two months of data to pour over when they come back in February. And I think by then we'll start to see clear signs and signals from them that the top is definitely in sight and they're going to be taking a pause to see how much it slowed down and, and is it going to be consistent with 2 to 3%. And Warren, that pause could take quite some time. They could sit and watch for quite some time because some people even are suggesting by the end of 2023 the Reserve Bank could be cutting interest rates. The, the impact of the rate rises could have a, a detrimental impact on the overall economy. But, you know, really, the Reserve Bank here has not gone as hard as other central banks around the world. And kind of, if you like, the outcome of Australia's economy is going to be dependent on what happens in other parts of the world. Well, to some extent, for sure, there's definitely a, a linkage there. If, if anything, what's come out of 2022 for our economy in 2023 is a massive positive income shock from high commodity prices. Mm -hmm. And we've heard of, you know, seen record agricultural prices. This is going to flow through the economy right into 2023, uh, supporting not just incomes, but demand in the economy. I think the big issue for the consumer is going to be a softening in good spending, which has been strong all through the pandemic. And it's all going to be about what happens with services. Mm -hmm. You know, is that going to hold up? Is If the labour market holds up, if that spending holds up, that's going to be a challenge for the RBA. So, really, it's not just, you know, I just can't see the, the rate of good spending continue the way it has been. There's only so many whippersnippers we can put in our garages. But it's the services side that's been strong in the second half of 2022. And if that stays strong in 2023, that's going to keep the pressure on the RBA. But the other thing that's also been a feature of our economy has been labour shortages. And so we've had mm. these record low unemployment rates in Australia, which means that Australian households have been able to absorb the impact of mm. rate rises and energy price rises because they've had incomes. Mm. It's not like they've lost incomes. But the question comes also down the track that if company profits start to be affected by inflation, by any lag in consumer demand, then that could start to see the unemployment rate rise. That's where a bit more hurt might start to be seen in the Australian economy. Yeah, I mean, I think at the very least, and I agree completely on the services, I think that's actually what we're going to get in the National Account data. So there's a big swing back to services in the third quarter. Uh, but more generally, on uh, the outlook for the labour market going forward, I think even if we, uh, we do hit that soft landing, employment has kind of stagnated uh, for about six months now, more or less, it's been bobbling around. Uh, I think we'd like to see that continue we know the vacancies data is starting to come off. Uh, businesses are anecdotally reporting it's slightly easier to get the people they need when they need them. We know some companies have pared back on those hiring decisions. These are all signs that the economy is cooling. That is what we want. We can't keep going the way we were in the first half of this year. Uh, but that, in terms of feeding into the labour market and you know, perhaps gradually lifting the unemployment rate a little bit, I think we should expect that. 3.5% is not sustainable and we, we have to uh, accept, if you like, that it's going to be more like 4 maybe even 4.5% 
that I think is inevitable, but that's still exceptionally low. That will be a very good outcome if we don't go above that. OK, but then, Warren, you go to the government, which has succeeded in getting new industrial relations rules through and laws through, industry-wide bargaining now becomes a part of it. So that means there's going to be pressure for more wage rises to keep up with inflation. So that means that companies themselves are going to have to make decisions as to whether they continue to hire, whether they try and absorb those, those wage increases, or whether at some point down the track they start to shed work. Workers. Mm, yeah, well, the IR, new IR laws are just complicate the picture. They're going to give more power to workers, just as they were getting it anyway from a strong economy and a very tight labour market. Uh, it remains to be seen how that's going to play out, but it's not going to put downward pressure on wages. And, of course, it's likely to put upward pressure just as wages get to about as high a rate as we want to see. So, look, does that affect the demand for labour? It's hard to say. The demand for labour now is well above the supply. Supply is starting to come through in terms of the borders being open. It's very gradual. But you look at job vacancies, you look at job ads, we've still got to take a lot of demand out of, mm. labour demand out of this economy. And yeah, that's really the first thing that's happened is the demand that goes, mm. not just the unemployment rate going up. And you know, in the US, Fed Chair Powell said they want, to, they want to reduce the notional demand. They don't necessarily want to push the unemployment rate up. Mm. So. It's a very fine line because with an unemployment rate at 50-year lows, wages growing, the economy's not going to slow down that much. It's mm. not going to, the inflation pressure isn't going to be alleviated. So I still think this all argues for a central bank that's got still a, a lot of work to do on inflation. OK, so, Sarah, then go to one other aspect that is important to Australia. Warren mentions there about, you know, workers coming in from overseas. And we know that uh, even as we get to the end of this year, that the level of travellers to Australia is only about half the level it was mm -hmm. pre-COVID. Now, China is an important part of this story. And what China has done in the past year, trying to go to zero COVID, is it tries to open up over the next 12 months. The trajectory of its economy is going to have an impact on our economy here in Australia as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the arrival state is really interesting, actually. If you split it out into the short term and the long term, actually, the migration, I agree, it does look like it's now recovering. And some of the visa, the leading data on visa applications and approvals is really positive too. So it looks like the migration is going to come back next year. Um, on the visitor travels, the short term visitor tourists, essentially, mm. um, that is definitely still only around about half what it was pre-COVID. But it's worth keeping in mind that at the same time, we're not travelling overseas anywhere near as much as we were. So it's a bit yin and yang. It's That's not coming in, but we're sure. not going it's over there. It's the inflationary, there. you know, aspect of the yes. rising, you know, exactly. prices. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so it's an interesting sort of balance there. But more broadly for China, I mean, it has an impact on the world economy. It's the second uh, mm. largest economy in the world now. It reopening, consumers there getting back to spending, perhaps some, uh, you know, extra support for the property sector there. And that is starting to appear from the authorities. They've put a lot into it to get that going. Uh, that is definitely uh, generally a positive, particularly a positive for us. We're probably, we're already seeing actually a bit of a bounce in iron ore and steel prices as a result. So all of those effects will start to come through, uh, the income effects too, and that'll be very good for government as well as for the mining sector itself. So yes, that, there is a positive offset there, but it, we'll just have to see how it plays through and how much of that is able to offset the general slowdown in the globe global economy that's happening everywhere else. And, and Warren, one interesting thing about this, so far Australia has again shown that it is the fortunate country, the lucky country, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been hit as hard with interest rate rises as other nations around the world, nor by inflation, nor by necessarily COVID in some ways. But the fact is that we don't live alone, that what happens in the United States and Europe does have an impact here. And this is going to be, again, one of the overarching themes over 2023 as Europe and potentially the United States fall into recession. What happens to capital markets? What happens to capital flows? Because this all affects the price of money here in Australia. Well, I think they're the most powerful linkages, uh, whether it's foreign direct investment, whether it's just asset pricing, you know, equity price levels, um, the currency, interest rates, all of that's important. I suspect the downturn coming out of Europe and the US will be driven by a big slowdown in demand for goods. It'll be a long, drawn-out recession. I think the Bank of England is flagging this. And ironically, that might not be good for Australia because if it's not a deep recession, it won't have a big negative impact here and we'll be left to take care of our own inflation problems ourselves. We will have to play catch-up on rates. We will have to address our excess demand. If we saw a financial crisis emerge next year out of the US or out of Europe and that sent you know, chills through the whole world economy and things seized up, 
ironically, that would probably be good for us because that would save us from having to jack rates up here. But I'm worried that that we're going to see a shallow, drawn-out recession, which will mean we've got to get on with it. And with China, I am worried about China. They have benefited massively from the surge in demand for goods right up until this year, or right up until 2022. 2023, the, the demand for goods is going to be soft and that's going to hurt the Chinese economy and I am not confident that they're going to fire up domestic demand, not consumer demand anyway. They might fire up infrastructure and that might be good for iron ore, but there's only so many bridges to know where they can build, as the Japanese showed us. So I'm more worried about the effect of China slowing and what that means, both geopolitically and confidence-wise, as well as obviously those direct links to us. Sarah Hunter, Warren Hogan, many thanks for your time. Thank thanks, you. Ross. After the break, we break down the big changes to the property market this year, which has experienced falling prices and a slowdown in demand. Welcome back. Over the past 12 months, the media landscape has been reshaped as digital rights become far more prevalent. Sports rights negotiations now hinge on digital streaming. Ross Greenwood caught up with James Manning, the editor of Media Week, to talk about what's in store next year. Sports rights have become essential to keeping an audience. I mean, the former Seven uh, chief executive used to say, look, I'm not sure how many might be watching one of our dramas in 12 months' time, but I know what the football will do, I know what the cricket will do. They're guaranteed audiences. And because of that, the, um, the cost has just gone up. There's been a lot of competition for that. The next one we'll see, the cricket's in play now. What will happen to that? I'm sure we'll see a, a reasonable increase. You, um, contract on contract when that's settled. And the interesting part about this is that the, the new streaming giants are now showing a propensity to move into this space. Now, they can see, like everybody else can see, the sport is the number, watched, number one watched you know, event on television. It doesn't matter whether you're streaming it or whether you're watching it directly. And so they're not you know, immune. They need to have a reason why the eyeballs, why the people will pay to go to their services. Yeah, it's been a little bit problematic for the streaming um, platform sport, but we've seen, I guess, the biggest um, person who's dived in has been Stan, mm -hmm. you know, with the tennis... Um, they've got the rugby. Um, we've seen Prime take some swimming. There's a bit of NFL they have, but as yet, there hasn't been a, a lot of sport. We, Netflix have held back from getting in there. So it's still largely the domain of the free-to-air broadcast. And KO, say, for example, showed that there was an appetite for streaming. So Foxtel pivoted to go to that streaming service and, and it certainly was highly popular being able to completely stream all of your data. This is the, the beauty of the way in which Australians are now consuming information and data. Yeah, I, I guess yeah, well, I should have mentioned KO, but I guess that's usually seen as part of the subscription TV platform. It's a, it's a Foxtel offshoot. But, yeah, you're right. Wow, has that been successful? It's really helped turn around Foxtel, which was sort of stagnant. There wasn't a... Didn't seem a clear way forward for it. But then they, they launched KO, fantastically successful. But, again, it's cost them, you know, it's cost them dearly. Those sports rights aren't getting any cheaper, as you mentioned. And then they've sort of replicated that with Binge, which is the non-sport uh, platform. And that has overtaken uh, KO in terms of subscriber numbers. Look, it's been a bargain, $10 you can, a month you can get in there. It's the, nearly the cheapest thing going around. Will they, they'll probably need to lift that price to make it sort of a bit more profitable, but at the moment doing very well. OK, so then take me back to a few other bits and pieces on that media landscape, because it's number one about the advertising, the advertising revenue you can get for sponsorships when you create the content, when you get the eyeballs on that content. But it's about taking that sponsorship further these days, isn't it? It's about the digital rights. It's about the slicing up of the content and being able to sell it so many different ways across all of the various platforms that are out there. Yeah, look, the digital right, rights used to be an afterthought. You know, the, the AFL... They went to Telstra. There wasn't a lot of interest in TV hanging on to it. I think the same with the NRL. Um, the cricket, Seven famously, didn't get the digital rights when they first got the cricket back, which was seen as a bit of a mistake in retrospect. Uh, but now it's very essential. And you, as you say, look at what Foxtel's able to do with KO. If they didn't have those digital rights, you, you wouldn't have KO. It just wouldn't be there. But it's, a, yeah, it's an essential thing now to have those digital... And there's always that battle between um, free-to-air and um, subscription, who will get the digital rights. We've seen in the latest AFL deal, they're going to be split a little bit. Seven, for the first time, gets to keep the digital rights for the free-to-air games it has, mm. while Foxtel also has the digital rights for, you know, they use on Fox Footy, I'm talking the AFL, 
and um, KO. So this is, is it, this is all content, right? So it's interesting, you go to V8 supercars, you know, the, the V8 supercar teams are actually almost the actors on the stage. <laughs> the AFL teams are the actors on the stage. But then when it goes to drama, of course, trying to create that content is becoming ever more, uh, ever more uh, sort of costly to those businesses. You've got Disney bringing Bob Iger back in because the Disney Plus channel has certainly been successful, but they're going to find ways to be able to commercialise that. You've got Netflix now, you know, cash flow positive. So there's a lot of changes in this landscape in terms of the, the power of these organisations to continue to pump out that content. Yeah, look, I think we're going to see that. It's the free-to-air TV has been sort of helped the um, streamers, if you like. They've backed away from drama. It's been a lot more on sport. It's been a lot more on reality TV. Drama's not made so much anymore, but we've seen, OK, the streamers have identified that. You know, Netflix has built itself off the back of good dramas. You think of House of Cards, which yeah. is their big first global breakthrough show. You know, The Crown. You know, they're still... They sort of almost have that space to themselves. There's still drama on free-to-air, but nothing like that the... Um, the cut through and the engagement that the streamers have been able to create. OK, but all of these businesses rely on consumer sentiment and consumer spending because it's either advertisers who require those consumers to spend for their products or indeed for streaming services where people might have three or four suddenly saying, actually, we might now flick between one and the other. They're jumping between the services to be able to go, oh, we like the crown, we'll go there. Oh, we like a different series, we'll go there. It's an interesting dynamic, the way in which behaviour, the consumer behaviour is also changing. Yeah, look, consumer spend is going to be a huge focus next year for everybody from from free to air with, with the budgets, is there going to be impact there? For streaming services, there's a bit of research around that shows, you know, over 50% of people will be cutting their spend on streaming platforms, you know, so there's a bit of jostling around about what will they keep? You know, most people expect probably keep Netflix. It's almost the default brand, isn't it, when you think of streaming services? But lots of, you know, Disney Plus, uh, Paramount, they're both undergoing big sort of... Uh, Amazon Prime, Apple, yeah. oh, you've got yeah. all of these things, yeah. right? So there's so many of them out there now. Absolutely, yeah. And they're all sort of, you know, they have um, share price pressures too, you know, when their subscriber numbers go up or down, it doesn't necessarily impact the company hugely. You see Netflix, it might only be a million or two out of 200 million plus, but that can send the share price up or down significantly. Then they have to be seen to react to that. Um, and then that can impact what they spend on content. Well, I'll tell you what, Joan, it's going to be fascinating watching over the next 12 months because clearly consumer behaviour is driving all of this. But then it changes the content we see, the prices we pay, and, if you like, the viability of many of those companies. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks, Rob. Property prices have fallen this year as interest rates rose to their highest level in a decade. I caught up with Eleanor Cray, the senior economist at REA Group, to recap the key events in property in 2022. Yes, certainly. It has been very different to last year. And really, we've seen that the fast pace of interest rate rises that we've experienced this year has very quickly rebalanced housing market conditions pretty much Australia-wide. So the substantial 300 basis points of, of tightening that's been pushed through to date has significantly reduced buyers' borrowing capacities. It's increased mortgage servicing costs. Uh, and with that, it, it shrunk buyers' budgets. And we have seen that property prices have begun to fall in, in most places. Uh, now, on a national level, the PropTrack Home Price Index is showing that home prices are down 3.81% from their peak in March. Uh, but there are some regions where property prices are falling a little bit faster. So if we look at, say, Sydney and Melbourne, home prices are falling a little bit more with that fast pace of rate rises, really weighing more on higher value regions. Yeah, and as those rates have gone up and property prices have been falling, have some sellers now become a bit hesitant to put their home on the market? They might hold out until prices get a bit better. Yeah, we could potentially see that is the case. And, and don't forget, a lot of people are um, sitting on substantial home equity uh, accumulated uh, since the pandemic onset, really. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've seen significant rise in home prices. And even though we've seen prices begin to fall, in most parts of the country, they're still well up on pre-pandemic levels. So that's also meant that, you know, even as interest rates have quickly risen and mortgage servicing costs have risen, um, 
most people just don't have to sell. So we have seen, of course, a little bit of a dent in confidence as well with inflation surging. And I think that's also, uh, I guess, reduced people's propensity to list their property for sale a little bit and, and reduced some of the activity that we were seeing in the market from both buyers and sellers. We're filming this in mid-December, so we don't have the full year's property price data, but we can put up a graphic showing annual price rises to the end of November. And what kind of jumps out at me is New South Wales and Victoria have been falling, but there are some other states like South Australia which are on the rise. What's the kind of main reason for that? Yeah, exactly right. So we've seen that actually property prices in South Australia have continued to hit a, a fresh record high um, really month after month. That's both in Adelaide, so the capital city, mm -hmm. and regional South Australia. Uh, now, what's going on here is we still have uh, really those trends that we've seen from the onset of the pandemic in terms of the preference shifts towards larger homes, more space, uh, migration trends, and of course, the relative affordability advantage uh, that is uh, retained by the Adelaide property market and regional South Australian property market that really continues to help propel property prices in those regions to, to fresh record highs, even as interest rates have quickly risen. Let's look at the median property values. Sydney, just under a million dollars. Melbourne, about 800,000. But the one that jumps out is ACT, up 38% since March 2020 to $851,000. So Canberra's now the second most expensive city in Australia. Exactly right. And if we were to take that from March 2020 for Melbourne, property prices are actually only up around 15% in Melbourne um, on pre-pandemic levels. So I think a lot of that, uh, I guess, gain uh, has been attributed to the past uh, couple of years where we really saw property prices in, in Canberra soaring with record low interest rates, uh, those uh, preference shifts that we saw and migration trends that really buoyed the Canberra property market over the past couple of years, of course, before um, interest rates started rising, then we have seen that home prices in Canberra have begun to fall this year with the substantial um, interest rate tightening that has been pushed through. And the others that jump out, Brisbane up 44% since March 2020 and Hobart about 44% as well. So these state capitals, it looks like they're starting to catch up to Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra. Yeah, I mean, we saw that uh, the Brisbane property market and actually really the Southeast Queensland property market uh, overall um, really outperformed throughout the pandemic period. Um, so we know that uh, migration or net migration into Queensland was more than two times the decade average um, throughout much of the pandemic period with people um, in the East Coast capital, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, partly looking to escape lockdowns uh, and headed uh, for the relative affordability advantage that property in South East Queensland and Brisbane presented. Uh, and of course, uh, those preference shifts towards larger homes, lifestyle uh, and the, the sun, I guess, after all that time in lockdown for people in Melbourne. We've got another chart we can put up from SQM Research. It basically just shows listings for the year at 241,000. And if we go to the next page, we've got REA's graphic showing annual growth for listings across Australia and um, nationally down about 22% this year. But that's really just a reflection of where the property market's at. So when we look at listings, we haven't quite seen that seasonal or that seasonal strength in new listings that we would expect um, throughout spring. We have seen that, uh, you know, the, the dent in consumer confidence that has come with the fast pace of rate rises, with inflation pressures, cost of living pressures, um, has potentially weighed on uh, vendors' propensity to list. So we haven't quite seen that strength in new, new listings that we would expect. Um, throughout the spring selling season. Um, so it, it has been a bit of a different picture to previous years. Um, but certainly we did see throughout the first half of this year, we can't forget uh, that the strength in new listings was historically very, very strong, with a lot of people making up for the lost time from last year, um, time in lockdowns and whatsoever that really um, potentially held them back from listing their property for sale. So the first half of this year, buyers started out with really a lot more choice. And that has tapered off a little bit as the year has um, unfolded. And we've seen that, uh, I guess, the, the picture in the property market has shifted quite substantially with interest rates rising very quickly. Well, Eleanor Cray, Senior Economist with REA Group, thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me.
That's all for Business Weekend this year. Ross Greenwood and myself will be back in the new year with Business Now and Business Weekend. Thank you for all your support throughout 2022. See you in 2023.